Well, I think it's fair to say that the first season of Rings of Power was a bit underwhelming, to say the least. The characters were badly written and the plot was filled with so many contrivances that you could just rename the main characters as undeserved success number one, two and so on. All these tropes made me think that Rings of Power at its heart resembles not its original movie inspiration The Lord of the Rings, but something of a B-movie. The style, tone and bad writing all points to that direction. But it didn't have to be that way. I think if you take the show as is, with a few tweaks here and there, you can make it a much more entertaining watch. So I thought I'd make a sort of fan fiction what if video. What if I could fix the Rings of Power? What if I could give you an alternate version of it, something that is much better than the original show? In this video I won't mention at all the storyline of the Harfoots and the fake or not so fake Gandalf. Since the show didn't bother to connect their story with the other storylines, I won't either. Now there are some rules here. The changes that I make will still follow the basic premise, characters and storylines that the show has set up. I'm not gonna add any new characters other than a couple of extras here and there and some battle scenes to make it more interesting. My goal with this video is to focus on the characters, the drama, the moral dilemmas and the difficult choices that follow and in the end make rings of power good, if that's even possible. So if you're into this uh, what if fan fiction, come along with me in this ride as I attempt to fix the rings of power. One of the biggest problems that the show had was that it took forever to set up the sticks, to give us a why. Why are the stories of Galadriel, Elrond and Arondir important and worthy of our time? Galadriel wants to find Sauron and his army of orcs, but it has been almost a thousand years since anyone has ever seen an orc, so no one believes her. It takes several episodes, more than half the season actually, for Galadriel to meet and fight an orc in battle and to feel vindicated in the process. Before that, she just acts in blind faith of second-hand information that she gets from here and there. As setting the stakes of the story go, a similar thing happens with Elrond. It took the show forever to reveal Mithril and when it did, it felt very disconnected from the main storyline in Numenor with Galadriel and Halbrand and we had to reach the finale for things to make sense. Arondir meets several orcs, but because he's so dumb and pussy whipped, it's nearly impossible to have much respect for him as a character. He does one stupid thing after another, like jumping in the orc tunnel without backup, and because he's this stoic, silent type, he doesn't get a chance to speak to us, to justify his actions, and it's difficult to relate to him and understand him. In order for this alternate rings of power to work, and flow better and become a more engaging experience, I think it would be a good idea to set up a hook for the story as fast as possible. And a good way to start would be with the threat itself that the show leans on so much, with Sauron, or at least with his broken sword. The son of the widow, while playing in the forest, hears an eerie whisper coming through the thick foliage. Something draws him in, almost sleepwalking, he follows the whisper, taking him further into the dark woods. He kneels by a peculiar round giant rock. As he wipes the brown leaves of the wet soil, he sees the edge of a piece of black cloth. When he pulls it out, he stares transfixed at the broken sword of Sauron. The evil within is almost unleashed on the world. Black clouds hide the sunlight above, making the day night. The eerie whispers become stronger with every second. He can't take it any longer. He covers the sword with the cloth and runs away. This new beginning would work as a hook. It sets that the dark forces of Sauron do exist and aren't just a story or a myth of some bygone times. And furthermore, it sets up a logical consistency, a story building block which more evidence of the existence of Sauron can be added later on. So when the next scene Galadriel insists that she can feel Sauron and his orcs are nearby, we can sort of feel and understand her and we can sympathize with her when no one believes her. This denial of the existence of Sauron within the story from everyone else around her would make Galadriel's character work like an underdog and who doesn't like underdogs. There is this trope in storytelling of the stubborn anti-hero going against the status quo someone that has hidden knowledge that the rest of the characters don't and therefore they don't believe them and question their leadership and their ability to solve whatever problem the plot demands, be it the murder mystery or the hunting down of some orcs. 
And in Rings of Power, this stubborn anti-hero is Galadriel. But because the first episode starts with no orcs and no Sauron, Galadriel doesn't seem to be someone that knows something that others don't. She doesn't have some hidden knowledge that will guide her forward. She doesn't come off as a trustworthy and reliable leader, but her obsession makes her seem as petulant and annoying, someone that cries wolf with no evidence to support their claim. In the first episode, Galadriel found no orcs, endangered her men by taking them on a big journey with little provisions and backup, and they almost died fighting the cave troll. But when she returns to Eregion, she gets a slap on the wrist, faces no consequences, and the king sends her to Valinor just because she's a nuisance and he doesn't want to deal with her. In this alternate version of Rings of Power, consequences will be very much a thing. While fighting the cave troll, one of Galadriel's soldiers dies. Now we have a story with actual stakes in it, characters that die if they mess up, and this death is going to be especially important because it's an elf. Having a story where no one is safe, not even an elf, would add tension to every fight and battle for the rest of the show. So Galadriel was stubborn and narcissistic, an immortal princess that cares a little for other people, and I don't want to change that, but I do want to give her some introspection of her actions and some much needed inner conflict. She returns to a region ashamed, having lost the respect of her comrades and her king. Now she wants to find a way to gain that respect back, and she will do so by proving that she was right all along by finding Sauron and his orcs. The basic dynamics of Galadriel's story won't change, but these tweaks would put a more human face to her character and it would be easier to understand her. She fucked up and she wants to clear her name, but she's so stubborn and bloodthirsty that it's difficult for her to acknowledge said fuck up. The thing is, so Galadriel wanted revenge for her brother, but that's an external reason. If she gets her revenge, it won't change who she is as a person, and since we know she won't get her revenge for a very long time, this desire seems empty and hollow. But with this tweak, trying to earn back the respect of her people, it gives her an opportunity for some growth that the character desperately needs, and it would also keep her in this middle space between anti-hero and underdog. Someone that we can like because we know she's right, but as an anti-hero, she can dip her toes to bad guy territory without losing her status quo as one of the good guys. And most importantly, her dogged pursuit of Sauron won't come off as an illogical petulant journey, but as something that is tied to a real human emotion, respect. And that is something that we can all understand. But respect isn't enough to make her jump off the boat just before it enters Valinor. We need something tangible happening. And this tangible thing would be to see the son of the widow succumbing to the temptation of the whispers of Sauron. When he returns to the forest and grabs the sword, an ancient evil awakens in the world. Maybe dark clouds fill the sky again and Galadriel can feel the evil of Sauron freezing her body. Even if she's hundreds of miles away, we can accept that she alone has access to some kind of connection with this evil and she can sense it, maybe because her bloodthirsty path of revenge has corrupted her and gave this evil a way to get inside her. This idea that the evil is corrupting Galadriel can be used in this alternate version of events. The more Galadriel is pressing forward with her path of revenge, the more she feels the evil growing inside her. And we get to see this conflict between good and bad personified by the morally ambivalent choices that she will make in this alternate season. But more on that, we need to actually see how this evil makes its mark on her. Maybe with a montage sequence, seeing Galadriel's anguish as she feels the evil inside her, intercutting with the son of the widow grabbing the sword as it comes alive, and maybe the evil that the sword symbolizes makes its mark by a shallow and faded mark on the body of Galadriel, which will become more intelligible further in the season as he pushes for her revenge. And we could have a scene where Galadriel gets out of the water and makes sure to hide this mark from Halbrand because she doesn't understand exactly what it means, but she sort of knows and feels it's bad and she's ashamed by its existence on her body. And furthermore, in the final episode when Halbrand is revealed that he is Sauron, it can be hinted or outright said that Halbrand being in the middle of the ocean close to Galadriel wasn't a coincidence, but he was drawn by the effects of the evil on her body. This feeling of evil for Galadriel lasts only for a moment, but it makes her jump off the ship. 
the show has already set up at the start of the episode that evil can feel cold. Okay, the whole thing as a trope is a bit B-movie, but we're not working with some huge wonder of cinema here, but with the rings of power, so I think it's good enough. The son of the widow takes the sword of Sauron back to the barn, and that will attract Adar and his orcs to the little village. The love story of Arondir and the widow was very stale and boring as it happened in the show. Arondir doesn't really have a lot of depth as a character. We meet the couple and they're just together and then stuff happens and then more stuff happens. It never really sat right by me that Arondir, an immortal elf soldier, falls in love with a mortal woman. Why does he find her interesting and attractive? How come does he even notice her at all? I mean, the actress that plays the widow isn't exactly stunning or anything, and her personality as a character isn't something that would turn the head of an elf. So I think there needs to be a deeper reason that Arundir falls in love with the widow. A deep wound, most likely, from his past. Something old and forgotten. When he was young, he failed to rescue a young and beautiful peasant girl from dying near his watch. He was friends with her, and her death shook him in a way that no death ever before. Now, years later, he fell in love with a widow because he sees that lost girl in her. Aether and the orcs come to get the sword of Sauron from the barn, but stumble upon Arondir. He fights them off, but they're too many. When Aether doesn't find the sword, he takes Arondir back with him to the little concentration camp he's got going on. The sword was missing because the son of the widow took it with him to show it to one of his friends. Just a little side note here. In Rings of Power, we meet one elf after another, but they don't behave like creatures who have thousands of years of experience and intelligence. That always bothered me, so I think Arondir needs to figure out a way to escape the concentration camp using his head and experience instead of just running away. Possibly by colluding with the other captured elves and creating a massive distraction during the daytime, using to their advantage that the orcs get burned by the sun. Arondir could have started small fires and made some fuses with some sticks and grass. The orcs could chase him through the forest, thinking that they were protected by the shade of the trees, but when the foliage would start to burn and the shadow they provide would go out, the orcs would get burned as well, and that would give Arondir the time to escape. And for us, the audience, it would give us the chance to respect Arondir, as someone who didn't get himself in trouble, but got out of it using his intelligence, courage and experience as a soldier. Let's go back to Galandriel now. I found it quite annoying that the show used contrivances all the time to get the plot moving. Galadriel had to be rescued by Halbrand, that had to be rescued by Elendil on board his Numenorian ship. I think that's too many contrivances in one episode. Instead, you can use this time having Galadriel and Halbrand spend a little more time together getting to know each other. Halbrand would be the reason that Galadriel does some introspection on her actions. It would be easier for her to talk about her guilt about the death of her soldier with a stranger, especially if they're on a raft in the middle of the ocean during a storm and there is a good chance they'll die. That would be an opportunity to put a human face in front of Galadriel's narcissism and elitism that she's been pushing all season. Even if that mask of superiority falls for just a second, it would add layers to her character. As for Halbrand, he doesn't judge her at all. His presence has a soothing effect on her. With Halbrand, she can say whatever the hell she wants and he's completely fine because he's bidding his time, wanting to see who Galadriel really is. After some time on the raft, they reach the shore. Galadriel has been told by the people on the first raft that they were fleeing the orcs. This information can be added to her experience when she felt the evil of Sauron and jumped off the ship. Now she knows that her intuition of the existence of Sauron isn't based on just her feelings, but instead is grounded in reality. She feels vindicated and determined to find him and his orcs. The difference with the original version is that so Galadriel gets second-hand information about the orcs and relies only on feelings that Sauron is back. In this version, we get to see that she's right and feel frustrated when people don't believe her. Galadriel and Halbrand make it to a little harbor there she notices a Numenorian ship that has stopped for provisions. She convinces Elendil to help her by mentioning the presence of the orcs, so he agrees to sail them to Numenor to consult with the queen. And Galadriel convinces Elendil to tag along, not by shouting at the top of her lungs that she is an elf and it's his right to obey her, but she senses Elendil's sense of right and wrong, and she uses his chivalry to her advantage. 
It would be nice to see Galadriel have layers in this alternate version. Someone that has lived thousands of years would have the wherewithal and presence of mind to smartly manipulate Elendil to get her to Numenor. She knows Numenor is the closest and strongest kingdom in the area. Even if so Galandriel, an obsessed, narcissistic elf, didn't even care for any of that while barging into Queen Mirel's kingdom and demanding her help and later on an army, this alternate Galadriel would know when to use diplomacy and when to use brute force to get what she wants. In Rings of Power, the whole part of Numenor felt very long and tedious. Galadriel and Halbrand didn't really have much to do there and it seemed that the show ditched its characters to buy time until the final episodes where the battles and all the big revelations happens. But things could have moved much faster. Now that we are in Numenor, there's a chance for Halbrand to grow a little bit as a character. So Halbrand was this scraggy, brooding dude that goes to Numenor, works as a smith, fights some guys in the square and just follows Galadriel and whatever she does. Because the writers knew he was Sauron all along, they kept all his wants and needs hidden. He was like a moving and talking mystery box and that prevented his character to grow and become more interesting. His true intentions were only revealed in the final episode, but this is just another sign of bad writing. So Halbrand was a character with no agency. He was just a chess piece that was waiting to be moved in the right place at the right time. Rings of Power is constructed heavily around these mystery boxes. They exist solely so they can fill the void of badly written characters and plot lines. The minute I saw Halbrand, I knew he was Sauron. Just because the show never gave us a second or third choice for who Siron is supposed to be. Halbrand is the only morally ambivalent masculine character that exists in the show. There is no other choice but him to be Siron. But here's the thing. For us, the audience suspecting that Halbrand is Siron isn't a bad thing by itself. It would add his character more ambivalence. So Halbrand doesn't really want anything. He's a drifter that must be pressed to accept his role as the future king of the Southlands. But instead, consider this, alternate Halbrand would have a very clear desire to be king. When he lands in Numenor, the first thing he does is look for allies. He searches for the ones that are weak and shady, so he can make a deal with them. And with this plan, Halbrand would quickly find Isildur and the long bearded politician quite eager to make a deal. Halbrand would stay clear from Elendil, having already seen he's a man of principles, that he can't be corrupted. So Halbrand slash Sauron takes advantage of Isildur's thirst for success and recognition. He promises Isildur a ship of his own if he helps him gain his kingdom back, even if no such kingdom exists. What matters here for Halbrand is the corruption of Isildur's principles as a way to secure his alliance. Halbrand will do the same with a beardy politician, promises of political support and exclusive trading contract with the Southlands. These shrewd moves would make us say, who the hell is this guy? If he's Sauron, why does he care about politics and trading deals? But Halbrand's character arc would be similar as in the show. Halbrand slash Sauron sees himself as someone who believes that people need to be ruled. The world needs peace with whatever means necessary. At this stage of his career, shall we say, having allies would be a prudent and wise idea for Halbrand. Sauron is of course a half-god. You expect from him a certain planning that goes years in the future or maybe even more of course. After Galadriel is denied help by Queen Miriel, even if in this version she tried to use diplomacy instead of brute force, she starts to scheme and plot. She notices some details in the behavior of Queen Miriel's guard and her handmaidens, like they are scared of her. Driven and obsessed to find the truth, she climbs to the tower, goes behind the back of Queen Miriel and discovers the king to be bedridden. There, Galadriel uses this opportunity to blackmail Queen Miriel for an army. Queen Miriel understands that even a whisper of the truth can overturn her rule. She knows that her people will be furious if they found she has stolen the kingship, so she agrees and gives Galadriel her army. But he informs her that she can only spare 300 men and 3 ships. They are too few warriors and she worries about their fate since no one really knows how many orcs they will face. Galadriel, blinded by her journey to kill orcs, doesn't care one bit about the future death of the army of Numenor and presses the blackmail. It would be interesting to see Galadriel have some doubts about the blackmail. As an elf, she's supposed to be the role model of morally good behavior. Someone that knows better than to use blackmail. But Halbrand soothes her, telling her that because she's an immortal elf, 
she knows better than any mortal queen or king there is. It's in Halbrand's best interest for the army to sail to Numenor, and these doubts would give Galadriel some vulnerability and make her more likable in the process. So Galadriel doesn't have much doubts. She doesn't care and does whatever she wants. Since we don't have clear conflicting emotions from Galadriel, she comes off not as an anti-hero that does bad things for a good reason, but just as a selfish asshole that wants to fulfill her needs and doesn't care about anything else. Queen Miriel finally agrees and the army of Númenor sails to the Southlands. Halbrand has already agreed to pay Isildur fame, glory and riches if he helps him, so that gives Isildur a chance to stop being a groveling, sniveling child. He conspires with his friends to come to the aid of Halbrand when he asks it. Halbrand's motive was to have a personal little army to help him if something goes wrong. He told lies that there is more little kingdoms to conquer alongside the Southlands, and if Isildur and his friends help him, they will be rewarded handsomely. Halbrand as a character needs far more depth and complexity than what we got in the show. He uses his connections with the beard guy to get himself in the room with Queen Miriel. There he asks her for support to get his kingdom back in the Southlands, but she, being the shrewd politician that she is, already knows that the line of kings has been cut a long time ago. But Halbrand claims that he's a bastard that lost the battle long ago and wants to reclaim what's his. A scene like that will muddle the waters even further. Is Halbrand Sauron or just a shady and manipulative bastard prince that wants to retake his long lost throne? At this point in this alternate rings of power, Galadriel Halbrand and the army of Númenor have just sailed for the Southlands. Now I think it's a good time to go back to the beginning and check out Elrond's story. In the original show, Elrond's storyline didn't really have any kind of urgency. He goes to the dwarves, Durin breaks his balls because he hasn't seen him for 20 years, then slowly, very very slowly, we learn about the mithril and later on what effects it can have on the disease that ravages the lands of the elves. As it stands, Elrond's story doesn't have any kind of urgency, tension or dramatic importance, nor does it have any kind of interesting character development, and of course his storyline doesn't connect with the main storyline of Galadriel until much later on. And I think that's too many problems for one character to have, so let's go ahead and fix them. In this alternate version of Elrond, the King of the Elves shows him the disease that ravages a region right from the first episode and tells him that if we can't find a way to stop it, the elves will have to go back to Valinor. Elrond, being a no-nonsense diplomat, proposes to start evacuating immediately. The elves already have a home in Valinor, they've been in Middle-earth for ages. The threat of Sauron and his orcs has been vanquished, so Elrond believes that there is really no reason to stay in Middle-earth anymore. And here it would be nice to give the character of the king some flaws as well. He doesn't want to go to Valinor. Maybe because there is a hint that Galadriel's insistence that Sauron and the orcs are back got to him. We don't know, we're not sure. The king informs Elrond that one of his spies has told him that the dwarves have found a new mineral that can maybe help with this strange disease. It's a long shot, but it would be wise to check it out. Elrond isn't entirely convinced, but he obeys the orders of his king and goes to the dwarves anyway. There he finds the dwarves changed. They behave strangely, secretively, like they're protecting something. I would keep somewhat the same events in the Durin slash Elrond storyline. Now that Elrond knows his mission is to get the Mithril from the get-go and in the process save Eregion and the Elves, his story takes a much more needed urgency. This urgency will give his storyline a clear direction and it will create opportunities for good drama and heightened tension as he tries to get the mithril from the dwarves. In the original version, Elrod's storyline was bogged down by slice-of-life elements that took too long to progress and made his story feel boring and unimportant, because there was no urgency behind it. Only much later on in the season, there was some tension when the king of the elves told Elrod of the importance of the mithril. That's why in this alternate version, the mithril has to be revealed right away, and as changes go, Elrond has to change as well. He needs to be a diplomat that, as the story progresses, becomes a spy. Elrond sees the rift between Turin and his father, sees the two factions within the dwarves' camp growing, and I think it would work well that throughout the season we follow that rift, opening wide open, and in the end a small-scale civil war slash conflict 
breaks with casualties on both sides. Durin, consumed with greed, wants to mine the mithril and make the dwarves rich, but his father is old and stubborn and he feels that an ancient evil will be awakened if the mithril is extracted. The changes in Elrond's storyline will add tension and remove the slow, slice-of-life element of the story of the dwarves. In Rings of Power, the main storyline is about Galadriel, Halbrand, Numenor and the threat of Sauron and the orcs. So the Elrond storyline didn't really have a lot of time to grow. I would keep the civil war in a slow burn mode, something that takes half the season to really unfold. Because in this alternate version Galadriel stays in Numenor for only an episode or two, I think there will be ample time to focus on Elrond and see his story grow. There we will see Elrond torn between his identity as a diplomat and a friend of Durin and someone that needs to do anything he can so he can acquire the Mithril and save Eregion and the Elves from ruin. In the end, the story of the dwarves should end much in the same way as the show. Durin and his father reconcile, but in the alternate version his father pulls rank and makes the decision to close the Mithril mine without giving any to Elrond no matter the consequences for the elves. Here we see some agency, grit and personal growth from Elrond when he sneaks inside the mine during the night and steals a small quantity of the mithril, which at the end of the season will be used to make the elven rings. Elrond leaves for a region with the mithril accompanied with a small band of elven warriors. A few nights before Galadriel reaches the Southlands, Aedar and his orcs search for the broken sword of Sauron, Arondir, having escaped from their concentration camp the day before, has already warned the villagers and they all have run and hid in the watchtower. The orcs siege the tower but fail to capture it. Arondir knows it's only a matter of time until the orcs break through, so he has the villagers create a distraction and escapes on his horse carrying the sword of Sauron with him. He knows that Aedar and the orcs want to get the sword back more than anything else, so it makes sense that they would follow him and leave the villagers alone. When a little bit later the orcs break through the watchtower, Aedar learns from one of the villagers about the deep relationship between Arondir and the widow. So Aedar puts a knife to her son's throat, threatening her that if she doesn't help him find Arondir and the sword of Sauron, her son will die. Torn between her love of Arondir and her son, she chooses the latter. Arondir has told her where he was going, because he wanted them to follow him when the orcs lifted the seeds. So the widow, alongside a few orcs, rides for Arondir. Now it would be interesting if there is a deeper, personal and more selfish reason for the betrayal of the widow. All this time she has sensed that Arondir still has feelings about that peasant girl that died long ago. Arondir hasn't told her much about this girl, but her jealousy has been eating away at her for some time now. It kills her that she has to split Arondir's love with someone else, even if that someone is dead. And in some level she wants to hurt him, because she thinks he doesn't love her completely. So the widow's betrayal has both an external reason, either blackmailing her, and an internal reason as well. Before all of that, during the big distraction at the siege of the Watchtower, a lot of the villagers managed to sneak away through a small service door and they have gone back to their village to get some of their belongings and run away. Aider and the orcs hunt them down and start killing them, but not before Galadriel and the army of Númenor come to their rescue. As I've said in my review, the army of Númenor isn't really an army, 300 men are way too few, mainly because Númenor has no idea how many orcs they will face, so it stands to reason that Elendil will press Galadriel to send a few scouts ahead, so they can at least have some valuable information about the army they will face. But Galadriel is so bloodthirsty that she refuses. The army of Númenor is much better at fighting than the orcs, so Aedar seeing the battle not going his way, he orders a full retreat, making sure to keep the son of the widow close by. He's the only hold that he has against the widow. The army of Númenor chase Aedar and the orcs through the forest. Now, I never really felt any real danger or any threat coming from Aedar, He's like this one-dimensional classic bad guy, dressed all in black following all the tropes coming from old B-movies. But the thing is, he could have been so much more. Aedar is an immortal elf that turns bad. Someone like him, with so much knowledge and experience, 
should have had a much better plan about getting the sword of Sauron back and creating allies in the process. It's the same total lack of intelligence and forethought that all the elven characters are written with. So I think it would fit in this alternate version if Adar was a little more intelligent and capable of strategic thought. He has already scouted the area, and as Galadriel and the army of Númenor chase him and his orcs, he leads them to a swampy part of the forest. The horses of Númenor get stuck, and the heavily armored knights become easy prey for the orcs, since their armor weighs them down and they can't move as fast as they would like. Adar inflicts a ton of casualties on the army of Númenor, but it costs him a lot of orcs. His priority is still finding the sword of Sauron, so he retreats and leaves the army of Númenor to lick their wounds. Meanwhile, during the battle, Queen Miriel suffered a heavy blow to the head, and for now, her condition will be about the same as in the original show. She loses her sight and can't go on. At this point, Galadriel, bloodthirsty from the battle, orders the army of Númenor to chase down the last remaining orcs. But since Queen Miriel is incapacitated, Elendil is the one in charge. He refuses and insists that Queen Miriel must be taken back to the ships to recuperate. She can't ride fast in such a state, and there aren't enough knights to split the force in half. Galadriel is livid, she can feel how close she is to winning and killing all the orcs. As someone who is an immortal princess, consumed with the thirst for revenge for her brother, she views the lives of the injured mortal men and the blinding of Queen Miriel as accepted losses of war. So she puts a sword to the throat of Elendil to make him order his knights to obey her commands, but Elendil doesn't back down and a fight ensues. Halbrand and Isildur have already made their alliances and have secured the support of a few men. We can have a short B-plot before the battle where Halbrand, Isildur and his friends go on a little side quest and raid a small village where Halbrand knows there are some keepsakes hidden. The treasure is quite small, but it blinds Isildur nonetheless. After this, his loyalty to Halbrand will be much stronger. As the battle between Galadriel's forces and Elendil's Rages on, Elendil is shook that his own son is against him. Of course, he doesn't want to fight him, but as I've said, the rules in this video is that the characters should start and end in about the same place as in the original version. The show gave Isildur a fake death trapped in the burning house, but we know that he's alive because he was alive in the Lord of the Rings lore and opening of the first movie in the Mondas sequence. And a similar thing will happen now. During the battle, some of the knights of Númenor push the less armored and experienced men of Isildur towards a cliff. Elendil, realizing that his son is in mortal danger, orders the knights to retreat, but his commands get lost in the heat of battle. The ground at the edge of the cliff gives away, and Isildur and some of his men fall. Elendil is crushed, thinking that his son has died. At this moment, his sense of loyalty and honor to his men and queen is all that he has left, and he doesn't want to lose them too. So he orders a full retreat and goes back to the ships with Queen Miriel and whatever knights he has left. Meanwhile, Arondir's horse is near its breaking point from the constant riding, so he makes a small detour and finds a refuge in an elven watchtower, a similar structure with the military outpost that we saw earlier in the show. But there is another reason he chose to stop in this watchtower. It's because this is the place where the rendezvous between him and the widow is. Arondir's thinking was that he could ride to Eregion with the Sword of Sauron, while the widow and her son are safe in the hands of the elven soldiers in the Watchtower. Arondir asks the soldiers for a new horse to keep riding, but the soldiers, seeing how exhausted he is, tell him that they have seen with the elven eyes a band of elven warriors coming to the Watchtower. That's Elrond carrying the Mithril, and the two storylines start to merge. In the show it happened way too late in the season, and Elrond had absolutely no effect in whatever Galadriel was doing. As I've said before, Elrond's story felt much more disconnected with Galadriel's, Halbrand's and Numenor's storylines. But with this change, whatever choice Galadriel or Elrond or Arondir makes, it will influence and impact its other stories. From now on, because all the storylines are connected, the overall story of Rings of Power will be more balanced and concise. The elven soldiers of the Watchtower tell Arondir that since there is a storm outside, it's better to just wait until Elrond and his warriors arrive, and he can join them in his journey to Eregion. It would be safer that way. So Arondir rests for a bit, but not until the widow arrives outside the Watchtower. The orcs that accompany her remain hidden in the nearby woods. Arondir tells the elven guards to let the widow in, 
and she's shaken that she now has to manipulate the man she loves. During the night, she finds the sword of Sauron, still wrapped in the black cloth, takes it and sneaks outside of the watchtower. Aaron realizes what has happened, catches up to her, shaken that she betrayed him. He puts the tip of his sword on her belly, but his love for her is still strong. She tells him that Aider has her son and she had no choice. Ardry takes the sword of Sauron back from her, but the orcs that the widow came with swarm out of the woods and attack. Soon, this little fight grows into a full battle when Aider and his orcs run down the hill toward Arondir. At the same time, Elrond and his warriors, not knowing exactly what's going on, but seeing their elven brother in danger, they join the battle. Arondir tries to protect the widow and the sword of Sauron. He's a fierce warrior and kills every orc that comes near him. But things quickly turn for the worse. The widow sees Aider holding her son at knife point. He signals her that if she doesn't stop Arondir, her son is dead. So she hits Arondir at the back of the head and when he loses consciousness, she steals the sword of Sauron and gives it to Aider. Aider takes the widow and her son with him and alongside a few orcs, they ride away. Galadriel and her band of warriors arrive after the battle is done. Disappointed that she missed all the fun, she informs Elrond what has happened so far and asks for warriors to chase down Aedar. But Elrond's priority is taking the Mithril back to Eregion. All this time with the dwarves, the political machinations and the slam manipulation against Durin and his father have made him a little more cynical than he used to be. So he refuses. The Mithril is more important. If the elves are secure and Eregion is saved, then can deal with whatever orcs are left at a later time. Galadriel, furious that no help is given to her, alongside Halbrand and her band of warriors, chase Aedar by themselves and catch up to him much in the same way it happened in the show. The difference here is that the weak, white-haired villager that plants the Sword of Sauron into the ancient Lego mechanism is replaced with a widow. She obeys Aedar's commands because she fears for the life of her son. Now, of course, this whole thing, the sword, the Lego mechanism, the ensuing volcano eruption is just plain stupid. Volcanoes don't work like that, but as I've said, the rules in this video are clear. We won't have huge deviation from the original plot of the show, and I have already allowed myself a few chases and battles to be added to strengthen the characters and give them some moral dilemmas so they can become more fleshed out and real. But the volcano has to go boom, and indeed it does. Galadriel is more upset that Halbrand is injured in the battle than the whole of Southlands being destroyed. The original show teased something like a quasi-romance between them but never really had the balls to go there. But if not exactly a romance, there could be the inklings of one. So Galadriel at this time wants to care for Halbrand, but her primary need is still the same. She wants to prove that she was right all along so she can gain the respect of the elves back. So she cuts the head of an orc, bugs it because she needs something that would work as a tangible proof that the orcs are back and alongside a gravely injured Halbrad, head back to Eregion. In the original version of the show, Aedar had managed to escape during the confusion when the volcano erupted. Arodir, the widow and her son end up all back together and that's how their stories basically end in the first season. Arodir and the widow's characters are very lackluster, their stories don't really go anywhere and having them return to the same point they started, a family of sorts, with a little conflict and no desires of their own, is a bit lazy dramatically and a bit vanilla for my tastes. In this alternate version, the widow is the one that placed the Sword of Sauron in the Lego mechanism and caused the volcano to erupt and soon after, when she saw all the devastation it caused, she has now found herself deeply ashamed of her actions. She doesn't even know if her son survived the explosion and thinks she might have killed him in the process. Arondir, not knowing that she was the one that hit him over the head during the battle, still cares for her and ends up searching and finding her in the woods grieving and tells her not to worry, her kid is fine and he brings her back to what remained of the village. Arondir's stoic demeanor will help keep a lead for now to all the questions that he should be asking like, how did the widow and her son escape Aedar? Did he let them go? And if that is the case, why? All these questions would work as a future dramatic conflict for Arondir. Questions like that would burn into his mind and push him to confront the widow at some point. When they come back from the forest, Arondir, the widow and her son reunite, but the widow now has to keep all her actions that led to this point a secret not knowing if and when Aedar comes back and if Arodor or someone else at the village suspects something. 
Her secrets will give all the boring family slash romantic scenes with Arondir a new purpose and some much needed tension to go along with it. Now in every interaction with him, she will wonder, does he know that I hit him over the head and stole the sword of Sauron and gave it to Aedar? Does he know that I caused the volcano to erupt? As things stand, Queen Miriel and whatever is left from her army is going back to Numenor to find it destroyed. Isildur is considered dead and all these storylines have basically reached their end. So now we go back to Galadriel and Halbrand. They arrive at the region but are refused entrance. Elrond and the other elves are not happy that Galadriel wants a mortal man to enter a region, but after she insists, they let them through. Galadriel leaves Halbrand to an elven doctor and prepares for her meeting with the king. She takes the head of the orc she took with her and sticks it on a spear and marches it through a region, holding it high so everyone can see. Feel free to call this mad lad Galadriel or something of the sorts. When Galadriel arrives in front of the king, she brandishes the head of the orc and tells him, I was right all along. Awkward silence and quiet rage slash sigh ensues from Elrond until the king finally acknowledges Galadriel's success and declares that the orcs are back for everyone to hear. He promises Galadriel an army so she can deal with the orcs as soon as a solution is found to the disease that ravages the ancient trees of Eregion and threatens the lives of the elves. Quite happy with all of that, Galadriel goes back to the elven doctor to check on Halbrand, but the doctor informs her that Halbrand's wounds are too great and doesn't know if he'll survive. Galadriel has a brief somber scene with Halbrand until she retreats to her quarters to think about all that has happened. Now in this moment of grim quietness, we see the mark of Sauron on her arm is becoming more clear. As she touches it, she starts to hear the creepy whispers that we heard at the beginning when the son of the widow unveiled the sword of Sauron. Terrified, she puts on a new change of clothes and goes to Celebrimbor. She wants to help him with the mithril so she can take her mind off the strange mark on her arm. Celebrimbor tells her he tried everything but the mithril doesn't bond with other metals. Disappointed with that, she goes to check on Halbrand, prepared even for his death. But once she arrives, she stands to find him in perfect health and all smiles. Halbrand tells her that we mere mortals are stronger than you elves think. This sudden improvement in his health perplexes Galadriel. She starts thinking that maybe something is up with Halbrand, but in the end doesn't pursue it any further because her mind is on the creation of the rings. Of course, in the original show, Galadriel did start it suspecting Halbrand after this, but the reason was quite silly. Halbrand had told her he came from the line of the kings of the Southlands. The fact that the line of that particular kings has been cut for a thousand years is what she uses to reveal Halbrand's true identity, but that revelation is a bit lazy. Since Galadriel is thousands of years old, she should have already known that, because she was there when it happened. That's why Alter and Halbrand doesn't hide the fact that the line of the kings has been cut and introduces himself as a bastard who wants to reclaim his lost throne. Alter and Galadriel already knows that and views Halbrand as a petty would-be king, but he's charming enough to go along with the charade and Halbrand admits as much earlier in the Alter and events when questioned by Queen Miriel. Instead, the revelation of Halbrand as Sauron must be tied to the very reason he came to Eregion, the Mithril and the creation of the Rings of Power. Both of these elements were the victim of fast and lazy writing, minimizing the story and characters and cutting corners to get to the Sauron revelation as fast as possible, so Halbrand is suddenly free to go anywhere he pleases inside Eregion without any guards and finds himself in Celebrimbor's lab after using some manipulation techniques that even an 80-year-old would see coming a mile away, he convinces Celebrimbor to mix the mithril with other elements so he can create the rings. Now, I might add, that is stupid beyond belief because Celebrimbor, a blacksmith with a few thousand years of experience, would already know that. It would have been the first thing on his list because, you know, that's how blacksmithing works. The difference here with this alternate version of events is that Halbrand will suggest using a less quantity of the mithril and gently pushes for Celebrimbor to try again with the various different combinations of other metals. Halbrand's plan, after all, is the creation of the rings and it suits him just fine if there is more than one ring. If more elves are corrupted, especially kings and queens, the better for him. 
because he would be corrupting the leadership of the elves and making their rule less stable and less stable government is eligible to be influenced and corrupted. Kellen Bribor, of course, would be furious that Halbrand, a mere mortal, would give him suggestions about blacksmithing. After some soothing words from Galadriel, Kellen Bribor gives the shot and starts working on the mithril again. But not before he insists that Halbrand leave his lab. Halbrand doesn't particularly like that, but goes outside anyway. Kellen Bribor tries again a combination of metals that he had already tried before. After a while, he stares at the burning embers, shocked. The mithril is bonding. He has no idea how is that so, because it didn't work just moments before. As he cries out in joy, Galadriel feels pain coming from the mark of Sauron on her arm, and she starts to hear the creepy whispers once again. She turns and looks around, something, a feeling is drawing her outside. She follows the whispers out of the lab until she sees Halbrand. He stands by the water, his back is at her, his head looking at the sky, his hands outstretched. As he comes near him, the creepy whispers in her head are deafening. When she touches him, the mark on her arm lights up and she gasps in pain. Halbrand turns and Galadriel staggers back as Halbrand reveals his true shadowy form as Sauron. The whispers were the spell that Halbrand slash Sauron made to bond the Mithril into the three elven rings so he can control them. In this alternate version of events, a magical aspect is introduced to the creation of the rings that either wasn't really there in the original version or it was left for us to speculate at best at least. When Galadriel confronts Halbrand, now Sauron, all the events that brought these two together will be revealed. Halbrand will tell Galadriel that her thirst for events has been corrupting her for millennia, coming into a frenzy height these last few months. He felt this corruption drawing him closer to her, even from a thousand miles away, and that is why he was at the raft in the beginning of the story, searching for her, so no contrivance or coincidence is needed for them to meet. Sauron was actively looking for Galadriel, and because Galadriel is an elf, someone that is supposed to be above everyone else, in a moral sense at least, it made it much more easier for him to track her down, because she was the only elf that has been corrupted by Vengeance. Now, I'm not really into the Tolkien lore, and this is a fan fiction video, so I have no idea if that's even a thing or not, or even if it has happened before in the Tolkien stories, but I'm going with it anyway. Halbrand's justification for his character will be the same as with the show. He needs Galadriel by his side so they can rule Middle-earth together. In the original version, Galadriel was indeed obsessed and did questionable things, but the show never treated her as someone that did anything wrong or that she needed to repent for her actions. But here Halbrand hammers the point that Galadriel has strayed from the beaten path. Because of her, Queen Miriel has become blind, the army of Númenor has been destroyed, and Galadriel failed to protect the Southlands and its peoples. And all of that happened because she was too focused on revenge and clearing her name by proving the orcs were back. All of that will hit especially hard for Galadriel, because all of it is true. After all, she did blackmail Queen Miriel for the army of Númenor, and in the end brought down their destruction. But Halbrand doesn't view Galadriel's actions as a bad thing. He's a big picture dude, and he quite likes it that Galadriel has the same philosophy as him, that the end justifies the means. Now, it would be interesting if Galadriel is actually tempted by Halbrand, even if it's for a moment, especially when he tells her that when the elves find out she let Sauron inside the region, she will be cast out and be left alone in the world. This temptation for total power is important because it gives layers to Galadriel and it will connect with the events of the Lord of the Rings movies when Frodo suggested to Galadriel to take the ring herself, but she freaked out. And she freaked out because it has happened to her before. This moment here will be the setup for that particular payoff. Here in this moment, she understands what she will gain by siding with Sauron and what exactly she will lose. And this thought absolutely terrifies her. Just now she realizes how far vengeance has taken her. She realizes the consequences of her actions and what really is at stake. A temptation like that doesn't exist at all in the original show and I think it's completely necessary for the character. You can't have an anti-hero that does all these questionable things all season and not have a moment that is actually tempted by Sauron's offer. Now, finally, to go back to the scene, an extremely terrified Galadriel pushes Halbrand away and severs the connection. When she wakes up, he's gone. Along with him, the mark on her arm is gone as well. 
she has rejected him and now she's on a new path. In the show, Elrond found her by the water unconscious and the story had to bend over backwards so she won't reveal that Halbrand was Sauron. She tells Elrond to trust her and like an idiot, he does, just because the episode was ending and the writers had run out of time. But here in this version, Galadriel wakes up alone, she hurries to her chambers unseen, changes and suffers quietly. She knows that the elves must not know that she lets Sauron inside a region. The show ended with Galadriel insisting that three rings will be created instead of one and the alternate events will also end much in the same way. But since we have allowed Galadriel to have some time for herself and realize where her choices has led her as a character, the creation of the rings will be more tragic and have much more impact on her. Galadriel has achieved everything she set out for. She has proven that Sauron and his orcs are back and she has cleared her name. But all of that came at a great cost. It was a pyrrhic victory. She knows that since Sauron has helped create the rings of the elves, that those rings will also have a corrupting influence on her people. But she can't say anything about Halbrand slash Sauron because she will again lose their respect and her position as commander. She has been given an army to chase the orcs, but all she wants now is to stay back and find a way to break the spell that Sauron has placed inside the rings. And of course, as we know from the lore, that's not possible at this time. As for Halbrand, Galadriel will tell Elrond and Celebrimbor that he was ungrateful for all the help the elves have given him, and with the first sense he got, he left for the Southlands so he can claim his rights as a king. Since none of the elves wanted to let Halbrand inside the region in the first place, Galadriel knows that she's safe from Halbrand from now at least. It would be quite difficult for him to get inside the land of the elves for a second time without her help. This alternate Halbrand has spent much of the season creating alliances with Isildur and his friends and the beardy politician and Queen Miriel. He's not someone that will go to his volcano and sit on his fiery throne until Galadriel comes to him. He has plans of his own to create a massive kingdom with him as a ruler. So, to recap, in this alternate version of events, we meet Galadriel as an impulsive anti-hero, someone that does bad things for a good reason. But her actions slowly catch up to her, consequences start to mount, people get hurt and die, and most of the time, she's either unaware of the bad things she does, or simply she doesn't care because she's consumed by vengeance. Until the end, that is, in the Halbrand slash Sauron scene. After that, she finds herself a tragic figure with little options. These changes bring more nuance and subtext for the story and characters. Galadriel will need to go against the orcs while her heart is back to Eregion and the rings. She has secrets to keep and a grudge against Halbrand slash Sauron, but this grudge has a deeper meaning because all of what Halbrand said about her was true. Her quest of revenge did bring destruction and suffering, and now she has to reconcile with those feelings. Now compare all these changes to show Galadriel. The writers of the show never treated Galadriel as someone that does bad things. She isn't really an anti-hero. Instead, she's portrayed as a classic main character, a hero. She's not really confronted with any of her mistakes all season. And in the finale, after the rings are created, her story just ends and we don't get a scene where Galadriel has to reconcile with her mistakes and accept all the bad things she did. That's why I think all the changes in this video work much better and give Galadriel a much more honest look about her. She does bad things and people suffer and die because of her, but she realizes and accepts all those things and now she's on a new path to correct her mistakes. And for this alternate Galadriel story, that's pretty much it. I think all the changes work much better than the original show. It gives the character a tragic anti-hero aspect that was much needed, I think. For Elrond, he started out as a hopeful and decent diplomat and ended up a cynical spy, someone that doesn't like or trust that the elves are not dependent on these rings for their survival. So Elrond is basically a boy scout. What worries him most is losing his friendship to Durin. His story had no urgency, not until the final episode that is. In these alternate events, Elrond is introduced to the Sadui disease right from the start. He knows what he has to do to save his people and so do we. The events that follow slowly put pressure on him and he starts to change, which so Elrond never did. He just gets pushed to the sidelines in the final episode because there was nothing really for him to do. And although so Elrond does end with him having serious doubts about Halbrand and the creation of the rings, 
his storyline doesn't feel complete. He didn't really have any difficult choices all season and he was always a pushover, as shown early in the finale when Galadriel asked him to trust her. And he did. A timid boy scout is not someone that you would expect to actually do something serious and confront Galadriel about all her misdeeds. But having Elrond slowly throughout the season become a spy and manipulate Durin his father and in the end achieve his goal by stealing the Mithril, that is someone that you would expect to have some balls and actually do something about Galadriel. That is someone that you would want to watch out for. But so Elrond is about as threatening as a lukewarm tea. I mean, what's he gonna do? Write her a strongly worded letter? Come on. And that's about it for this uh, alternate Rings of Power. Let me know in the comments what do you think of the changes in character and story. These longer videos take a long time to produce, so I would appreciate if you like the video and subscribe. That's it for today, guys. See you soon.